Buongiorno, good morning. For today's video, we're going to start a little mini-series dealing with a tachometer that I want to make. Uh, the first stage of this will be working with the sensor that I'll use to detect the rotation of the spindle of this machine. One of the better sensors around for doing that is a reflective photo sensor. Uh, there's many, many varieties and brands of them out there, and they're very economical and quite uh, reliable. You do want to stick with one that's using an infrared light. That'll help deal with some of the, uh, we'll call it the noise of ambient light, especially if you've got sunlight in the area where your device will be used. The unit that I picked out is an RPR220, picked it up off of Amazon, it was rather economical, uh, so the cost was uh, truly inconsequential to what I was trying to achieve. Uh, but it had a couple of specs that I'll just point out real quick that were important to me, and I highlighted it here, was the response time at 10 microseconds, so it's got uh, the ability to handle the resolution that I want. I believe uh, the spindle that I'm going to be working with is somewhere around 12 to 15,000 RPM. So that's well within the capability of that. And then I wanted to uh, make sure that it would work within the range I wanted to place the sensor, which would be within 6 millimeters or in the inch world about 3 sixteenths of an inch. Uh, so for the, the specs of the unit, uh, those were the most critical to me. The voltage is everything else I can work out on the other end of this. For wiring, it's really quite simple. I had to uh, kind of simulate it with uh, these uh, discrete components, a phototransistor here and the LED, which is uh, in our case an infrared LED. Uh, but I hope this will be enough guide for you between what you see here and going by the data sheet. You can kind of put two and two together, as well as the breadboard, real breadboard view that I'll show you in a minute. Um, whoop, we got a boo-boo there. We'll get that wire connected down to the positive rail. I'm pulling out 3.3 volts out of the Pico. And that'll go in through two resistors. This resistor on the left is at 330 ohm, uh, which is a little bit on the high resistance level, but it works perfectly fine. Uh, you could certainly go much lower, probably even down to 200 or even potentially less uh, resistance. Uh, but that'll go into our resistor uh, and then off to ground and then back again uh, to ground back into the Pico. The uh, phototransistor side, the range of the resistor, I, uh, when I get into these phototransistors, it can be a little, uh, the math can be, I'm going to say, a little complex for picking out the resistor, and it's all theoretical. Uh, oftentimes, the practical is going to dictate more what your resistor value should be uh, in order to get a, a good, strong, positive on or off condition. And so, uh, kind of experience and practice over the years, uh, my working range with many of these is literally from about 20K up to about 80K. And uh, oftentimes, if I've got a, a, a situation where I'm, I'm not really sure how the photosensor is going to behave uh, with my uh, dark and light sensing capability, like the flag that I'm using, I'll throw a uh, prototype the circuit and put a potentiometer in there and then through experimentation find a good uh, balance between a low resistance and a high resistance between that 20 and 80k. Uh, in this example here it worked perfectly good from 30, I think it was actually less than 39k and then up to 47k uh, worked perfectly fine for switching on and off. Uh, but then uh, we've got one side of the phototransistor going back to the ground rail, the other side coming back uh, to pin number 15 uh, on the Pico. And that's the basic uh, wiring diagram. We'll come and look at the code here in a minute. Let me point out a few things here on the actual breadboard. Uh, and I'm going to have the data sheet up because I always... 
I can't remember from one minute to the next what I'm looking at, but uh, pin number three on the RPR220 is this uh, corner of the package that's chamfered or beveled. That is pin number three, which is the emitter directly opposite that. Across the narrow side is your collector, so that's your phototransistor side. Then, at back at, from my point of view, the top here on the left is your anode and then your cathode on the opposite side for your LED. So, realistically, uh, looking at this will be more practical than the fritzing diagram I put together for you, primarily because of how the package is constructed and how the components are inside that plastic package. Uh, but beyond that, there's your uh, 330 resistor, your 47K ohm resistor. I've got a couple of leads hooked up to my multimeter so that I can demonstrate the on-off switching voltages, which is kind of an important aspect of a phototransistor. You want, especially one that you're using digital and not analog, you want a good on or off. And the thing to keep in mind for that switching voltage I believe the Pico is 0.8 volts for off and above 1.3 volts for on. Uh, so that will help guide you as well as you look at your project and you're developing it. So we'll go ahead. I'll turn on my multimeter and I'm going to start the program so that we got some power going to the device. And right now, uh, I'm also going to turn off my overhead uh, light, so I'll be in the dark here for a bit. Uh, but that gets rid of some of the stray light that I was talking about that can interfere with the function of your infrared photoresistor or phototransistor. So uh, just using uh, no uh, reflection at all on this, we're at 2.8 volts. So that's a definite on. If I cover it up, and I'm pretty close to it, we're down around 0.17 volts. That's a definite off. Now I'm going to lift up my little business card here, and right about here is where we're switching between on and off. But if I come up higher, you'll see we're back up in that 2.6 volt range, and then I get close, it goes back off. Now, by its name, uh, reflective photo sensor, its really function, its real function isn't a light switch on and off as much as it is to uh, detect light and dark against a solid object. And to do that, I've taken a piece of paper, actually on my laser printer, I printed out a, a, a rectangular area there that's rather dark. On the opposite side, I magic markered it so we could see uh, where where the line was on the bottom of the paper relative to the sensor. But as we start out off, we'll move over, we'll get onto the dark line, we go high, come off the dark line, and then it goes low again. And of course, that's reading the bottom of the paper up against the sensor. So that's uh, the function of a, uh, photo, a reflective photo sensor. It's going to see light reflecting off of the object uh, between light and dark, and that is how we know it, or how it goes on and off. And then from that, we would do something with that data in our program. I'm going to get the light back on. Moving into the code to see how we deal with that. Uh, in this example, I'm going to use an interrupt to uh, detect uh, or react to the switching of the state of our photo uh, sensor. Uh, we're going to import uh, the sleep millisecond. Um, we're going to also import a pin from the machine library. We need to have an input set up from the Pico. We're going to put that on pin 15, and it's an input. Because the phototransistor gives us a very good off state below 0.8 volts and a very strong on state above 1.3, we do not need a pull up or pull down resistor to help influence the state. I've got a global variable here to count the number of uh, state changes or actually transitions from low to high. 
uh, so that we can count uh, the, the number of times something goes on and off. This short little uh, program or code section here, this function, sensor counter, is part of an interrupt handler. And uh, we've given it access to the variable pulse counter so that we can modify that every time this interrupt request is called. And that is defined by this particular code line here. We're establishing a photo pin interrupt request. The, hand, the handler will equal sensor counter, this guy right here. And what will trigger it, we're triggering on machine.pin uh, IRQ rising. So anytime that uh, transitions from off state to on state, it will execute this code. Now down here, we are uh, into a very simple endless loop. We're going to have another variable called last counter. That'll make sense in a moment. Endless loop. We're going to look to see if the last counter is not equal to the pulse counter, meaning that the pulse counter must have incremented up here in our handler. And then I'm going to print down here what the pulse counter is currently at, update last counter, so that we're not constantly printing out the data. And then we'll sleep for 10 milliseconds and repeat the loop. That way, not every 10 milliseconds, I'm printing something out. So we'll get this going. Again, and I will take my little piece of paper and pass it over our sensor. We go from low to high, and low to high again, low to high again. And as you can imagine, if there's a black stripe, like I'm doing with this piece of paper going over the sensor, on the diameter of a spinning shaft, I could easily look at that based on the number of times that transitions per second or per minute, I can calculate the RPM. So that is how I'm going to build this tachometer starting from this sensor. And that's really all there is to using this particular sensor. And keep in mind, it is configured as a digital uh, input rather than as an analog input. So that'll wrap it up for this video. Be sure to watch out for the upcoming video related to the tachometer itself. Before that, though, we're going to be talking about uh, one of these nice new small displays. It's a 1.8 inch diameter round display, and I thought that would be perfect for my tachometer project. And that'll be coming up real soon. Look forward to seeing you then. Thanks for watching.